Good morning, everyone. I want to thank the mayor. Everyone had told me about what a dynamic new mayor Jacksonville had, but I applied the acid test uh, last night. Uh, when I got in, I got into a taxi cab, and I asked the taxi driver how, what he thought of the new mayor. And he said, oh, he's terrific. He's really smart, and he gets things done. And when you get that type of uh, evaluation from a taxi driver, you're in great shape. When I was running for re-election as governor, I was running against Lynn Swan. If you're a football fan, you remember Lynn Swan. He's a charismatic, good-looking African-American who was one of the greatest receivers in NFL history, played for the Pittsburgh Steelers. So a friend of mine from Philadelphia was in Pittsburgh for business, and he got into a cab. Uh, cab driver was African-American, normally would vote for Democrats. So my friend said, what do you think of the governor's election? And the cab driver said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, who are you going to vote for? Are you going to vote for Lynn Swan? Cab driver shook his head and said, nope, too pretty. I'm voting. <laughs> he said, I'm voting for the ugly guy. <laughs> so whatever works. Well, as the mayor said, it is great that all of you are here. Why are we here? We're here to elevate revitalization of this nation and this state's infrastructure to the highest national and state and local priority. And the mayor has done that here, and you have. Jacksport, Jacksonville Chamber, CSX, all of you have done a great job in doing that. But we need help. Every one of the G20 nations in the last 15 years has undergone a five to 10 year infrastructure revitalization program where they spent significant new dollars to bring their infrastructure up to a point that it can be economically competitive. You have a great port here in Jacksonville, right? It's one of the keys to your city's economic success. It's the largest in the state of Florida. It's the 13th largest in the United States of America. Well, consider for a moment that of the 10 largest ports in the world, none are American. Six are Chinese. Consider that the port of Shanghai, by this time next year, will be taking more throughput than the 10 biggest US ports put together. And that translates into business, and it translates into dollars. And infrastructure improves our public safety. We don't want any more in Minneapolis's. We don't want any more levees breaking in, in New Orleans or Cedar Rapids. It's public safety. It's quality of life. It's, most importantly, long-term economic development and growth, particularly, as the mayor said, in the global economy. Well, you're not competing against Alabama and Georgia anymore. You're competing against Singapore and India and, and Germany and places all over the globe. And it's crucial that we rebuild this nation's infrastructure. And lastly, it's the single best job producer that we can have. Building America's Future, in its report called Falling Apart, Falling Behind, recommends a 10-year infrastructure revitalization for the, pro, for the nation in which we spend $200 billion a year more than we're spending now. Not all federal, state, local, and private, all put together, $200 billion a year more. And that would create, according to experts, $1 billion of infrastructure spending creates 25,000 new jobs. That would create five and a quarter million new jobs a year, each and every year for the next 10. They're all well-paying jobs. They're all jobs that can not be outsourced. You've got to do the work on the bridge here. You've got to produce the asphalt and the concrete here in factories. It's the single best way we can charge up our economy in the relatively short run and make it competitive for the long run. So what is the state of the U.S. infrastructure? Interestingly, eight years ago, not very long time, eight years ago, we were ranked by the World Economic Forum to have the best infrastructure in the world. They just released a report in the middle of last year. We now have the 15th best infrastructure in the world. In rail transportation, notwithstanding the great National Gateway Project, Clarence, we're 18th in the world. In port infrastructure, we're 22nd best in the world. In air transport, we're 32nd best in the world, behind countries like Panama, Malaysia, and Chile. Our infrastructure is literally falling behind. And it's falling behind because we've stopped investing. When Dwight David Eisenhower left the White House in January of 1961, 
we spent 12.5% of our domestic non-military spending on infrastructure. Today we spend less than 2.5%. We spend less percentage of our GDP on infrastructure, about half of what the, EU, the European Union countries spend, and about a tenth of what China and India spend on their infrastructure. The American Society of Civil Engineers says that we need to spend $2.2 trillion in the next five years to just put our infrastructure in fair condition. They ranked our infrastructure and they ranked it as a C minus. The country that had the first transatlantic railroad, the first intercontinental uh, highway system, the first this, the first that. We've fallen behind, we've fallen apart. And even here in Florida, where you do infrastructure better than most states, and certainly in Northeast Florida, Mayor, you're correct, you've got a significant problem. 14% of your roads are in poor condition. 16% of your bridges are structurally deficient. 57% of your highways are choked and congested. And think of this statistic. Since 1990, in roughly two decades, your vehicles on the road have increased by 77%. Your vehicle lanes have increased by 4%. There's 43% more population in Florida over the last 20 years, and there's been no, virtually no growth in your road network to support that. And eventually, that's gonna choke and stop development in its tracks. And let's take a look at the port. The mayor rightfully bragged about winning that Tiger application. But the Tiger application was for $45 million, and Jacksonville was very successful. It got $10 million from Tiger. Tiger was part of stimulus. It was competitive. And there were 828 projects seeking over $2 billion in stimulus. The projects asked for $14 billion. Only 46 of those 828 were granted. Jacksonville's was for the uh, intermodal container transfer facility uh, to move uh, uh, cargo, container cargo, from ships right on the rail. It's a great project, but it wasn't fully funded, just like National Gateway. We didn't receive nearly the amount of federal money we would deserve to receive because we underfund infrastructure. You can't, you, you know the old saying in business, you have to spend money to make money? Well, in investment programs for the government, that holds. I'm not talking about social programs, but in programs where there is an economic goal, just like in business. I say to my constituents, name me one business in Pennsylvania that's grown successful without investing in its own growth. And there isn't any, either from capital reserves or from prudent borrowing. That's how you do it, and that's how we can do it. Look, all of us know that Jacksonville sits on the verge of a tremendous opportunity, and it's called the expansion of the Panama Canal. And by the way, those Panamanians aren't dopes. They're spending over $5.5 billion to expand the canal. It will increase its capacity three times, and they're paying for it by raising tolls, by raising tolls on users. And it will create enormous opportunities for East Coast ports. In the old days, Asian traffic had to be delivered mostly to West Coast ports. But now that Asian traffic, that burgeoning China uh, shipping, can come to East Coast ports because the canal can handle the big mega ships that come through. But are US ports able to handle those big mega ships? Virtually none, except for Norfolk. We've got to get ready for 2014. And that means, among other things, that Philadelphia, Wilmington, North Carolina, Charleston, South Carolina, and Jacksonville, and other East Coast ports, we have to dredge. We have to dredge to get down to the depth that will allow those ships to come in show you the problem now without even Panama Canal expansion. Right now, the 59 busiest ports in the United States are only operable, the total channel dimension that any ship can go in, they're only operable 35% of the time, which means that if, you've, if you're shipping goods into American ports, you either have to reduce the weight, reduce the draft, or you have to wait for high tide to be able to bring your goods in, all of which raises the price of shipping goods into and out of the United States of America. So we've got a dredge. Anybody here, Mayor, does Jacksonville have the money alone to, to dredge? Uh, Jacksonville has no capacity any more than Philadelphia does or Wilmington, North Carolina does or Baltimore, Maryland does to do it on its own. We have to get the money to dredge and we have to do it now and soon 
to be ready for that expansion. Because if we're not, we're missing out on the opportunity to add millions of dollars in new investment and tens of thousands of new jobs. Now, what's Building America's Future trying to do to raise this issue in the minds of the Congress? Well, what we're trying to do is essentially tell the Congress men and women, essentially to give them a permission slip. Remember when you were in school and you got a permission slip you took in from your parents saying it's okay for Joe to leave school today at noon? Well, we need the public to give the Congress a permission slip to invest money in infrastructure. We need the public to tell them that it's okay, that it's something we want you to do as long as it's accountable, it's transparent, and the projects are selected based on merit, not on who has the most powerful congressman or senator. That's what the public feels. In the 2010 November election, we had the most significant conservative anti-spending election in my lifetime. And yet 64% of the transportation initiatives that were on the ballot, referendum, 64% of them were approved by a vote of over 61%. And every one of those referendum called for increased taxes, increased tolling, or increased borrowing because the public understands infrastructure spending. It's different than other types of spending. There was a return on the investment. It's not a red state or a blue state issue. The people of Charleston, South Carolina have voted twice to raise their sales tax so that they could put over a billion dollars over a 10-year period into expansion of the port of Charleston. But they can't do it alone. None of us can do it alone. We need a joint federal, state, local, and private uh, investment plan to turn around America's uh, infrastructure. It's something that can't wait. And you know, people ask me, well, why has it happened this way? Well, it's happened this way because we're afraid of taking risks. We're not risk takers anymore. Nobody wants to do anything that's difficult, politically or in any other way. So we sit around and and just wring our hands. Well, this nation was built by risk takers. If you go back to the Revolutionary War, it was a bunch of shopkeepers and farmers who had the audacity to think that they could beat the strongest army and strongest navy in the world, the British Navy and the British Army. If Las Vegas was, in, uh, was up and running in 1776, the odds on us winning the, the Revolutionary War would have been about 200 to 1. Didn't stop us. We believed in an idea. We took risks. And then when we became a country, we continued to be risk takers. When it came time to think about building the Erie Canal, did anybody say, well, we can't afford it? Did anybody say it's too complicated, it won't happen engineering-wise? Hey, when the Army Corps of Engineers went down to Panama in 1914, nobody thought they could ever create the Panama Canal. But we did it. We were the first and the best risk takers in the world. We did big things. We were Americans and we thought there was nothing we couldn't do. And now our infrastructure is falling apart and we're falling behind other countries in the world. Now's the time to change it. This is a seminal moment for us and that's why it's so great so many of you are here from different walks of life and different companies. I was talking to a few gentlemen from a title company and a title company won't directly benefit from increased infrastructure but you'll indirectly benefit because if we get money to dredge the Jacksonville port, there'll be a whole lot of new businesses and a whole no a lot of new people wanting to buy homes or build homes in Jacksonville. It'll be a ripple effect that affects everybody, not just in the city, but in the entire Northeast Florida region. And we have to do it. So at Building America's Future, we, we didn't just issue a report. We have an action plan. And we are right now in New Hampshire and South Carolina, two very important primary states, and we're in those states uh, organizing. We're organizing Republican elected officials, Democrat elected officials to sign on to our vision and our program. We're organizing chamber folks, business folks, but labor folks. We're organizing people from all walks of life to speak up about infrastructure, to write op-ed pieces, to talk at their local service organizations, to ask the candidates about infrastructure. And we have in New Hampshire, excuse me, in Iowa, uh, excuse me, in New Hampshire, we have put a TV ad on, which we're going to show you in a moment, to try to raise the consciousness of infrastructure. And so far in New Hampshire, uh, according to the New Hampshire Journal, 
Building America's Future has spent more on TV than seven of the nine presidential campaigns, and the primary is just less than a week away. We've tried to make an impact, and we have made an impact. Both Governor Romney in New Hampshire and Speaker Gingrich in South Carolina evidenced in their public statements the need to do something about infrastructure. Folks, you get what you pay for. If you buy a $35,000 a year car, you wouldn't stop spending money to maintain it, would you? Of course not. Because if you did, it would break. And that's what's happened to us. Opportunity is here. Opportunity is here. This is the time to do it. If we're going to borrow money, interest rates are at uh, all-time low. If we're going to do it right now, construction costs are at a, 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 almost an all-time low. They're not going to get any cheaper. Infrastructure spending is like that old Fram oil filler commercial. You can pay me now or you can pay me later. The American Society of Civil Engineers in 2004 issued a report saying it would cost $1.6 trillion to fix our infrastructure gap. Five years later, they issued a new report, and the cost was up to $2.2 trillion. We can do it. The conservative Congressional Buzz Budget or Office said that spending $185 billion a year more on infrastructure was justified in the benefits that it would produce in the jobs, taxes, and economic long-term economic benefits that it would produce. It's time to do it now. It's time for us to be great again, to build again, to do big things again, to do the Hoover Dam, the Erie Canal, the things that made this country a very special place. So I'd like to almost close by showing you our TV ad that's in New Hampshire. But we're doing more than just doing TV ads. We're doing uh, uh, town meetings. We've got these public officials writing up ad pieces. And in fact, I had the pleasure of joining with uh, Representative Ray and he and I authored an op-ed piece that was in your newspaper yesterday. And again, we're doing everything we can to raise public consciousness and to give folks that permission slip. So when you leave here today, if you believe that this is important, and I think you do or you wouldn't be here, I want you to consider talking about this issue to your groups and organizations, doing op-ed pieces, writing letters to the editor, but most importantly, writing your senators, writing your congressmen and say, we want you to spend money on infrastructure. We want you to invest in our economic future. It's okay. We understand. This is spending that has a return on the investment. It's okay to do it. In fact, it's imperative that we do it. So let's take a look at the TV ad. And then when we're finished with the TV ad, we're going to take a little bit of a break just because we're going to try to get the stage in place for the panel. But we're going to break in place if it's all right. If you want to stand up and stretch, that's okay. Uh, we're going to break in place, and then Representative Ray is going to come up and lead the panel. Uh, I'm going to take a few questions after we see the TV ad. So can we roll the TV ad? Let's see how good your technology is. You are so stubborn. I mean, come on, admit it. No, we don't need to spend more money on roads and bridges. Really? Really. Well, what if we do it right? Build it to last, base it on a real plan, not earmarks and stop sticking taxpayers with cost overruns. Someone did that. I'm for spending more. Great. So now admit we're lost and ask for directions. Done right. We can build America's future. You didn't see the first part of it, but it, it, it is catchy because it we wanted to focus people's main objection to infrastructure spending, which is it's just another wasted government program. Well, it doesn't have to be. It can be run right, and in, if we do it right, it can have tremendous return on investments. There's no question about it. The laborers' union uh, put up ads in four states. At the beginning of bridges that have been declared structurally deficient, they had big bill billboards that said, the bridge you're about to cross over is structurally deficient. Call Congressman Jones, and they gave his number. Well, the head of the laborers' union said he wanted to spend money to put on the other side of the bridge a billboard saying, glad you made it. <laughs> he said the lawyers talked him out of it, though, which uh, was unfortunate. Well, um, again, thank you all for coming. I'm going to take a few minutes of questions, and then we're going to take a short break for the panel. And I'm told there are microphones in the middle of the aisle if you want to ask me a question. It's a pretty docile group. Hi, good morning. Oh, there you go. I'm small, but here I am. There you go. 
All well, the way in the back. Yes. Um, I, I, based on everything you're saying, I know a lot of people believe in this or we wouldn't be here. I do have a question. It's a national initiative. Does that mean in places like you've mentioned Wilmington and the other ports that this exact thing is going on? And when you talk about getting federal dollars, it's basically so all of the ports can have an expansion and, and the dredging and handle the larger barges? I mean, this is a cooperative effort. Sure. Building America's Future, it's got representatives, uh, uh, government representatives signed up in almost all of the 50 states and most of the major cities. And by the way, one thing I didn't mention is there's something called the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund, where uh, users are uh, levied or taxed uh, for harbor maintenance. And that money should be available for harbor improvements and for possible dredging. It's got a surplus. But the Congress has been raiding the surplus to help it with its own budget deficit. That's not what it was meant when the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund was set up. It's not what it was supposed to do at all. So yes, the answer is this is a 50-state program. We're only starting in New Hampshire and, and South Carolina because those are heavy primary states. And we want to get the candidates on notice. President Obama, and I'm not being political here, but has indicated his knowledge of infrastructure. It was in the stimulus, the original stimulus, not at a high enough level, uh, and it's in his jobs plan right now. We want to get the other candidates committed to investing federal funds, and we're not asking the federal government for all the money here, not, not by any means, but we want to raise the issue with the candidates as well. We're also, we want to go into Virginia and Ohio and states like that where there are important congressional leaders that are in those states to again, get the public juiced up about uh, the need to do this. And yeah, we want a program that will help all those ports uh, because uh, we think it's important for um, the American economy from Maine to Florida. Sounds like we should put a lockdown up, down on the Harbor Maintenance Fund right now. Absolutely, so. <laughs> that, that's one of the Thank things we much. should do. By the way, they've done the same thing to the Highway Trust Fund. They raided the Highway Trust Fund which with the gas tax goes to, they rated that for the federal deficit. You know, it's like the old cookie jar. We gotta find a way to put a lid on the cookie jar. Yes, is someone else up there? Uh, yes. yes, sir, you mentioned the Highway Trust Fund. The way we fund tra transportation is an excise tax on fuel, state, federal, and local taxes. And with three to four dollar a gallon uh, gasoline and diesel fuel, uh, the American public just doesn't want to hear the T word. Uh, since we're talking politics, uh, Governor Huntsman on, on C-SPAN yesterday announced his strong support for natural gas as a motor fuel. He did it in Utah where it's a buck twenty-five a gallon. If you have a motor fuel that is cheaper than petroleum, than imported petroleum, and which would be domestically produced natural gas, of which Pennsylvania is now uh, becoming very robust in that resource, it makes it a lot easier to increase a tax or a fee, to add a tax or a fee to pay for infrastructure. So I guess my question is, how do we get the candidates and the American people to understand that we don't have to keep buying oil from countries that don't like us? that we can use domestically produced natural gas as a motor but fuel. That's an excellent question. And there's something kicking around the Congress called the Natural Gas Act. And the problem with natural gas as a fuel is not its availability. It is plentiful. And in the, with the new drilling techniques, we can now extract natural gas from shale. There's shale in uh, the Barnett Shale down in Texas in the south, the Marcellus Shale in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, New York, etc huge quantities of natural gas, natural gas out west as well, and with the new extraction methods, it can be plentifully available. It is about half the price of regular diesel fuel. Um, the problem is a distribution network. There's nowhere to fuel up, on, or very few places I can to build fuel a fuel up. station in six months. Absolutely, but who's going to build the fuel stations? Me. How much we money do you have? We one for the city of Clearwater. They're uh, selling natural gas, compressed natural right. gas today for two twenty-five. dollars I understand. But you, it works. Listen to me. Uh, do, you, do you have the money to build these uh, fuel, fuel distribution centers? 20% return on investment. I, I know, but I'm asking you, do you have the money? The answer is nobody has the money right now. So what the Natural Gas Act is seeking to do 
is for a short period of time allow significant credits so that we can build this fuel distribution network. And after we build it, if I were President of the United States, and I have no interest in spending, no offense to Iowa and New Hampshire, but I have no interest in spending two years of my life in Iowa and New Hampshire, but if I were President of the United States, I would call in every governor, every mayor, every county commissioner, every CEO of a large organization that has a large fleet, and I would say to them, gentlemen, ladies, in the next two years, I want you to convert all of your fleet vehicles to natural gas. If we did that, it would have a dramatic impact on, number one, the use of natural gas to fuel our, our vehicles, number two, our balance of trade payments. It would reduce our dependency significantly on foreign oil and would have a major impact in having oil prices come down too, because all of a sudden they can be competing against natural gas at half the price. So the gentleman's absolutely right. This is something we ought to be doing. We need to pass a comprehensive energy act, natural gas, trying to find a way to sequester, uh, capture and sequester carbon in coal production, renewables, all of those things. We ought to be able to sit down and pass an, a, a, a comprehensive act. We can't do that in an election year, just like we can't do a comprehensive transportation bill. <laughs> but these are challenges. If we meet them, we'll make this country great again. But we can't delay. We absolutely can't delay. Let's, let me take, Carrie, one more question. One more question, and then yes, we'll bring Governor. the panel up. Yeah, Th Governor. This is a comment. It's not really a question. I just came <coughs> back from a trip to China after spending 19 days and seeing Shanghai going down the river, seeing the dam, seeing everything else. I came back depressed. It was supposed to be a vacation. And when people ask me, I say, the Chinese are eating our lunch. The infrastructure they are building is unbelievable. The most effective way for you to get these congressmen to vote yes, get them on a plane, take them to a tour, spend five days in China. It will be more effective than having to go through <coughs> what you're going through. It was unbelievable what they are doing. First thing I did when I came back, signed up my little one to learn Chinese. And when people say, why? <laughs> I said, because I need somebody to translate for me in my old age. It's, I am not kidding you. You take them yeah. on a tour, let them go and see, and it's the most effective way. They're going to get scared, they're going to sign, and that's the cheapest, most effective way, and good luck. Well, the, the, I want to thank the lady for the comment, and it's absolutely right. I mean, people who travel anywhere come back, and they would, my constituents would say to me, what, what's wrong with us? You know, I was in, I, I took a train from Madrid to Barcelona, and it went, 220 miles an hour, and you, you could eat without a drop of soup falling on the, on the table. It was so, so smooth. What's wrong with us? They're building dams, they're building this, they're building that. And the Chinese know that they've got to create a lot of jobs, because what's happening in China is there's urban migration. People are coming in from the rural areas where there aren't any jobs into the big cities, and they've got to find jobs. And one of the ways China's doing it is rebuilding its infrastructure, not only rebuilding it, but building it for the future. They're building an infrastructure for the 22nd century. We have an infrastructure that at best served the 20th century. We gotta get with it. Um, we gotta get with it. I'll, I'll, I'll close by telling you a quick story. In 2010, in January, I was on a uh, TV show, one of them is Sunday shows, and the moderator showed me a clip of a very smart and effective congressman by the name of uh, Mike Pence. He was from Indiana, and Congressman Pence was in addressing the CCAP convention. The CCAP convention is in Washington every year. It's where all the conservative organizations come in. And he was pounding the rostrum, saying, we, yes, we're the party of no. We say no to spending, no to taxes, no to borrowing. And the moderator, the clip ended, and he said, Governor, what do you think? <clears throat> and I said, it's a prescription for disaster. If we do that, we will be a second-rate economic power before you know it. And that's where we're headed. And that lady told you what China is investing, not only in its present, but in its future. And, and she's right. And Congressman Pence uh, um, and I were invited by Fox News the next Sunday to come on together. And he went first and gave the same basic riff. And it came my turn and I said, Congressman, you seem like a reasonable man to me. Now, in truth, he didn't seem like a reasonable man to me. But I've been on enough of those TV shows to know you want to be the good guy. 
I said, you, you seem like a reasonable man to me. Can you tell our viewers how we're going to keep our roads, our bridges, our dams, our levees, our ports, airports, how are we going to keep them safe if we don't invest in maintaining their future, invest in maintaining them? And there was about 10 seconds of silence. And on TV, 10 seconds of silence is huge. And then Congressman Pence, who's a very smart man, the best he could come up with is, there you Democrats go again, talking, you know, using the word investment when you really mean spending. Well, folks, it doesn't matter what word you use. We invest to get a return on our investment. We invest to make us stronger, to build for the future. And ladies and gentlemen, if we don't do it, the Chinese will, the Indians will, the Germans will, the Europeans will, the Singaporeans will, and we will be left behind. I don't think that's the type of America you want. I know it's not the type of America I want. So we're going to take a, a, a minute or two break in place. Representative Ray is going to come up and lead the panel. And again, my personal thanks for this large turnout. We've done this virtually everywhere. And this is the biggest crowd we've got, with the possible exception of Pennsylvania. And in Pennsylvania, I personally called about 500 people to get them to go. Thank you.